All right. So there will be some more people trickling in. Um, as you can see, there's some fun stuff up here today. Um, there's some fun stuff. Uh, the programming for today's lesson is all due to Phil Levis. Thank you, Phil. So, um, or maybe not. I don't know, but he, I think you did most of it as far as I know. Um, but uh, we will get to this. So as long as you don't ask one question, we'll get to this. No, just kidding. Ask as many questions you want. We'll still get to it, I believe. Um, today we're going to start... We're starting to talk about uh, a little more detail on some C things, in particular some things you will need for the assignment this week. Um, so, uh, so that should help out a little bit. Feel free to ask questions about that. I know that pointers are hard, right? When you fr and they're not really hard until you internalize them and like figure out what we're actually talking about. And then you're like, oh, I got it. But it does take some time to like wrap your head around, hey, what does it mean to dereference this and cast to this and so forth? We'll go over a little bit of that today, but more we're going to talk about some of the like overarching principles, and then we're going to get to the fun stuff as well. Okay? All right. So um, this is where we are trying to go. Anybody know who this is? Jiro. Jiro, as in Jiro, or Jiro Dreams of Sushi, which is a, a really fun documentary. Turns out this guy, if you haven't seen it, um, he's like 85 years old, has been running uh, a three-star Michelin star, and by the way, they only give up to three, Michelin star restaurant in Japan. It's a sushi restaurant. The entire meal takes about 15 minutes, and it costs about $300. And you walk in there, and he serves you one piece of sushi at a time, and you eat them, and it's amazing, supposedly. Anyway, he's obsessed, and he's a master, and he's the best in the entire world at this, which is why his restaurant keeps doing that. However, at this point, you're kind of more on this stage, <laughs> which is like, you just learned about this stuff, and it's, whoa, what's going on, and, and so forth. And then, and by the way, I have not seen the next one, so don't spoil it for me. Don't come up, oh, that was, you know, blah, blah, blah. Don't spoil it. I don't know what happens to her. I think I do because I've heard too many spoilers already. But anyway, point is that um, that you you guys are at this stage where you're like, wow, this whole world has just opened up to me, and I got to learn the stuff. So to get to here takes a little time, 85 years or so, and then uh, and you're starting here. Okay, so that's what we want to do today. Uh, we're going to talk about um, a couple things that are just interesting about arithmetic for a few minutes. Um, then we're going to just talk about software and good software. And I saw a Piazza post or something uh, earlier today about, hey, how do I get not get that like minus for style or check minus for style or whatever, right? It's about writing good code that has good comments, that's clean, that's clear, etc. We're going to see some examples of that. Then we're going to talk about pointers and structs. Um, and then we're going to uh, go over an example of a heap allocator that's going to be similar to what you're going to have to write, just so you get in your head what you're trying to do. Okay, so that's the second part of the assignment, and we'll do that. All right. Have you ever wondered how your computer actually adds two numbers together? Like, how does it do 4 plus 5? I mean, we talk all the time about the fact that numbers are just bits. Now, you double E's may have already done this in some other class, so bear with us here. But some people have not seen this sort of thing, okay? If you do this, if we're going to do 4 plus 5, all right, what's the value of 4 in binary? Just do a 4-bit number. What's a 4-bit binary 4? 0, 1, 0, 0. And if we're adding that to 5, which is what? 0, 0 1, 0. 0, 1, right? Well, you do that one bit at a time, just like you would in decimal arithmetic, one digit at a time. You do that, you add the 0 and the 1, and you get 1, and you add the 0 and the 0, and you get 0, and you add the 1 and the 1, and you get zero. You get 1, 0, right? But remember, we do 0 and then a carry of 1, and then you get, you add, now you have to add 1 plus 0 plus 0, and you get 1, and does this indeed equal 9, 1, 0, 0, 1? It does, so that's what we're going to have to figure out how to do. And what's cool is you can do it with very simple logic gates. Who's seen logic gates before? Okay, double E's, probably most of you guys are like mechanical engineers who've seen this sort of stuff. If you haven't, I will introduce you to them very, very briefly. Okay, but before we get to the actual logic gate itself, if we have two digits, like if we're adding just two binary digits, Right? Aren't these all the combinations you can have? You can do 0 and 0 is 0, 0 and 1 is 0, 1, zero, 1 and 0 is also 0, 1, and 1, 1 is 1, 0. That's all you have to do to add two one-bit numbers. Right? Just add them. Okay. Now, here's how you actually do them. Now, these are, are uh, 
basically logic gates. It's the, it's the way we represent the function, like exclusive or an and, and these little lines here are just like basically wires, and if you go and take some more double E classes, you'll understand that, oh, we can build these out of some components and transistors and resistors and that sort of thing, and it actually is kind of cool, but for now, this is the level we're going to be dealing with. If you look at the adding two number, two one bit numbers together, you can do it this way. You can say, okay, the sum bit, okay, that's going to be the first bit here, is going to be the sum bit, okay? If you do that, it's going to be A exclusive or with B. And doesn't that make sense from here? Zero exclusive or with zero is zero. Zero and one is one. One and zero is also one, but then one and one is zero. That's the, how you would do the sum bit if you're trying to do this in just like logic, okay? If you want to get the carry bit, in other words, the other bit that comes out when you add those, right? Well, you've got zero, 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 one, right? And if we do zero, zero, and zero, one, and one, zero, then they all, if you do some instruction or some operation on that, you get zero, and then one and one, you get one. That's just an and operation. So if we do A and it with B for those one bits, we get the carry out bit. This is called a half adder and it is a uh, it's the logic diagram for how this works and it's very cool when you go whoa wait a minute this is how we add using voltages <laughs> right we use these things called like we use these very low level logic gates and there's only a couple more there's an or and there's a not and that's about it there's also a nand and some other ones but that's that okay so far so good like that's how you add two one bit, bit numbers together however right what if we want to add three one-bit numbers? Because didn't we have to do that in that four plus five example? We ended up having to add, remember when we carried the one, we had to add one plus zero plus zero. So we did need to add three. Now you've got a slightly different um, output here, right? And a lot of times, given the, amount of, given the amount of time we have, I don't think we have time to like scratch our heads and figure this out, but I would urge you to like go and figure this out. Um, there's multiple ways of doing this, but basically if you have A, B, and C, and you want the output to be this, these two columns, okay, you have to do a little bit more work, right? You have to do, first there's three numbers here, and you have to actually do a bit more logic on that, but um, here's what it actually ends up being. Okay, you end up doing the following, right? And this is, again, one way to do it. You could do it with other, you can actually do it completely with NAND gates, which are uh, just one gate if you wanted to. But this is how you would do it. So for instance, let's just do the sum part. What's the logic here? If this is an exclusive OR gate, and this is an AND gate, and this is an OR gate. Let's walk through how we do the sum bit if we're given three bits here, A, B, and the C, I, which is the carry in bit. How would we do that? What's the first thing we do to A and B? A, exclusive OR with B. Great. Okay. And then we're going to put that through another exclusive OR because the output of this one, in other words, what comes out of this exclusive OR gate goes into this exclusive OR gate. So we're going to do another exclusive OR here with what? What's coming in from this line? The carry in. So if we do that, that will give us the sum. Okay, and that's all you have to do for uh, that sum bit. And the same thing is true for the, you have to do the same thing here. You have to actually look through it. You have to go through an exclusive OR here, which is the same one. Then you AND it with the ANDing of the carry in with the A. And I would urge you to go and look at the arithmetic here and like try it and see if it works and see if this comes out the way it is. Right? But I think that's the, that's the most interesting part about that. Now, once you have this, which is called a full adder, this is a full adder, once you have a full adder, now you can start doing what? If we have two digits that come in and one carry out, what if we took another full adder and hooked it on to basically here for the carry in and two more digits for some other part of the number, what can we actually do with that? Well, if you don't know, turns out you can actually make an any bit adder out of this, which now you have eight bits, let's say, and you've got, here's the bit A0, A1, A2, etc. A0 and B0 um, are, and B0 is the other digit, like it's like, if this was like one, uh, if it was the number we used before, it would be 
uh, eight was, or sorry, it was four, zero, one, zero, zero, and then B would be zero, one, zero, one. That's how the numbers, and then you'd add these together. What's the original carry in for any number? Zero. So you'd actually put a zero there like that, and then you'd be done. And then what would happen is it would do this bit, feed its carry to this one, and then it would do this one, add those two bits plus the carry in, trickle all the way down the line, and there's your adder. And that is a pretty cool concept when it comes down to it. It's, uh, it's really neat that you can actually just use basic logic to add numbers together. And that's what your Raspberry Pi has a whole bunch of these on it. Now, it's a little more subtle than that. This one happens to be relatively slow. Why does this happen to be slow? Any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, you need the output of this one to go into this one, and then you need the output of this one to go into this one. This is called a ripple carry adder, and it actually ripples the carry all the way through, and it takes time. You better do this one before you try to do this one. You can't do it in parallel. Turns out there's other kind of adders. I actually built an adder when I was in grad school that does, um, that does this, except it does it in parallel because there's associativity rules that you can use to make it so that it works out, and um, that's much faster. So they have faster ones than this, but this is the basic one. Okay. All right, just wanted to show you that. This is how things get added when you're um, doing these. And this is an important one here, too. The carry out, like what happens if you get a carry out at the end of your number? It's lost, right? Because that's it. It's just gone, which means you have some sort of, yeah. You can stick them in the carry flag. You could say, yeah, well, that's actually what's going to happen, right? The carry flag is going to be set at that, when that happens, right? But you actually lose information if you're doing that. This is what happens when you wrap around, when you're adding numbers that are too big for the form they fit into, right? Or if you're using a, a signed number, it wraps to negative. If you're using an unsigned number, it just wraps all the way back down to zero, et cetera. So that's what happens there, okay? So this is this is the kind of the limitations, please. So what if, like if we're doing um, that, that first bit all the way on the right is... This um, bit over here? Yeah. That's actually going to be zero no, for no, this. Bit, sorry. This one, sorry, this one way over here. Nope. Nope. The one next to the, not all the way on the right, the one bit full adder, the first one there. If that's like five and four, then would it carry Caref, Careful, this is only going to be, this can only be ones and zeros. Right. This, this is like a... bit representations of five and four. No, no. This is a one and this is a zero. The only two... That's this, it. That's it. Okay. This, remember, this one bit adder adds one bit to one other bit. Plus a carry in. So again, I'll, I'll redraw it real quickly. If we had the 5 and the 4, right? The 4 for A was 0. Here's the 0 bit. Here's the, zero, the 1 bit. Here's the 0 bit. Here's the 0 bit. And we're adding that to 5, which is 0, 1, 0, 1. Okay. That's how it's going to add. And what's going to happen? 0 plus 1 is 1. No carry. 0 plus 0 plus 0 is, and then we had a 0, by the way, here. 0 plus 0 plus 0 is 0. No carry. 1 plus 1 plus 0 is 0, and then we have a carry. Okay. 0 plus 0 plus 1 is 1 with no carry. I was confused how the carry right? works. That's, That's how that works. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Any other questions on how that works? It's actually just very cool. I think the... When I, when I first thought out, I was like, whoa, that's how computers work, <laughs> right? Like, that's like, oh, now I know how computers work, right, because of this. So that's that. All right, now let's get into some C, okay? All right, here's a question for you. Oh, boy. If we do the following code, and we say unsigned int b equals 2, and then we say int a equals negative 2, and then we try to compare a and b, <clears throat> don't we have kind of an inherent problem here if we're trying to compare an unsigned number to a signed number? But C allows us to do this. In fact, it doesn't even give us a warning. It just lets us do it. We have to make some choices here. Yeah. Sorry. Why would it not or, work? Yeah. Because isn't an unsigned always just going to be positive, so you can just treat it as like a positive number? Good question. It is always going to be positive, but when it's trying to compare against like A, well, this one's, it's not going to truncate that big number. Like, it's going to have to do something here because you're trying to compare the actual representations of this number, okay? So, yes and no. <laughs> like, you have to think about it in, in yes, it's going to be, it could always be big, but this, a big B ends up being a very small negative, or un, a big unsigned in is a small, or a rather, or actually it depends on where you are, but a negative number in signed. And so you're still trying to do this comparison. And it's tricky. Phil, did you have a comment on that? No. Okay. All right. Um, so let's just let's actually let's actually test this, right? Let's actually go and test what's going to happen here. Any any guesses, by the way? Because these two may or may not have the same exact answer here. B and 
unsigned int b versus int a, b being 2, a being negative 2. If a is greater than b, so in other words, a, it's going to try to compare this. Which, what do you think is going to print out here? a is bigger than b or b is bigger than a? I hear both. How many people think a is greater than b? Uh, half of you. How many think b is greater than a? About the other half. Okay, let's try it. Okay, let's actually go and code this up and try it, okay? Um, I am going to code it up on my Mac, not on the Raspberry Pi, because sometimes it's just easier to do that, okay? Um, and I'll show you what I mean. Here we go. Okay, let's just do, in fact, I want to make it so that I can see the code so I don't get it wrong. Uh, let's do this. So we'll move that there, and that'll do that. Okay, all right. Vim test unsigned a, b, dot, c, something like that. Okay, and then I've got a little macro that actually populates stuff for me, <laughs> so it's kind of nice. So I do this all the time. Um, and this is if you're going to write programs for your Mac, you need to put a little a couple other things that we haven't learned about yet, like this pound include stdio, etc. The reason I'm doing this again is because it's just going to be easier to see the output because we don't have print. I don't want to plug in the pi; it's going to be used later and so forth. But let's actually do this. Okay, unsigned int b equals two. Okay, int a equals negative two. Okay, if a is greater than b, I always like the curly braces, print f a is greater than b, uh, okay, else, and hang on, oh, there we go, okay, uh, sorry, of course I like the curly braces, but I forget to use them sometimes, <laughs> there we go, okay, else we are going to uh, print f, I don't know why it's there, b is greater than a, backslash n, like that, and there we go. Let's make it do that. There we go. Okay. And then that's that. We good? Okay. So, oops, I don't want to encrypt it. There we go. Okay. Uh, you can type make test unsigned a b, and it should actually just make it like that, and it did. And let's find out what happens. Test unsigned a b. A is greater than b. Okay. So what it did was it said a is greater than b, which means that there was a conversion that happened here. What conversion did it have to have done when it compared these two? It turned the int into the unsigned int. Okay, That's what happens in C when you do this calculation. So we got to remember that, right? Let's change this to, um, let's just change it to an int negative 2. This one actually should not be hard to figure out. Like if this was, sorry, if this was a int b equals 2. This one's going to hopefully do what we want, because it's comparing an int to an int, right? So oh, I did it again. Hang on. There we go. OK. If we make it again, and then we run it again, now we should get b is greater than a. OK? Hmm. All right. So the question is, what are the rules? <laughs> right? Well, here's the rules. The rules are, if you have an unsigned compared against a sign, it will convert the signed one. It will do it as an unsigned value. Okay, that's the first rule. So if your rule is you're comparing two things that are like the same size and you have them as, un as one unsigned and one signed, it will do both of them as if they were unsigned. Okay, and by the way, the, the underlying processor doesn't have to do anything special to do that, right? It just compares the bits, right? In the end, it does that and then, then comes up with an answer there, okay? So that's how it's going to actually work. Okay, now converts it into an unsigned. All right, turns out there's conversions everywhere, okay? Here's a program. Actually, I'm just going to copy and paste all this into another thing. This is conversions everywhere, versions everywhere, dot C, and okay, okay. So let's look at what this is. I've got it in here. I'm going I'm to show it in a second, but let's see what's actually happening here. So here we've got, okay, we have an unsigned char 0xff. So far, so good. Makes sense. We can do an unsigned char up to ff, so that's good. And then we have an unsigned char also, an unsigned char, which is 0. And then we're going to do this. We're going to say if the complement of the unsigned char 1 equals equals uc2. OK, what is the complement of ff? You guys remember what if I flip all the bits? 0, right? So if complement of unsigned 1 equals unsigned 2, and unsigned 2 is 0, what, what should happen here? This, By the way, this means print an unsigned character. What should it do? It should say equals or say not equals? 
if we do the complement of FF equals equals zero? Should it be true? Okay, let's try it. Okay, let's do this, and we'll go back over here, and, okay, make conversion everywhere, like that. Okay, it actually was interesting. It gave us a little bit of a warning here, and it said, don't ignore your warnings, <laughs> right? It did give us a little warning here, and nice compilers will do this. So we'll say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This little thing has a type int. Hmm. What? It's an unsigned char. We know it's an unsigned char. Well, let's try this. Uh, conversions everywhere. Zero is not equal to zero, but it just printed down there, right? Then zero is not equal to zero, and you go, what? Right? And you're like, what is going on here? Well, what is going on? That's the big question. Okay. It turns out when you do things like perform operations on a, like bit operations, the underlying hardware doesn't have time to bother with doing a, a eight bit operation here. It does look. If I know I'm going to complement something, I'm just going to complement the entire thing in 32 bits, and I'm just going to make the other upper bits zeros for you, and then I'm going to complement it and whatever. And then that's what it's going to do when it does the comparison here. It's going to go, oh, well, guess what? This value here is a int. <laughs> right? It's going to go, well, why would it do that? Well, it's basically because the underlying hardware wants to do things easily. And C is like, look, we're just going to go along with it. I mean, that's kind of the rules. Now, this is codified into C about how this stuff happens, right? But it's based on the fact that machines, like, it defers to the machine doing the right thing fast. Okay? So you have to know this. So when you get warnings like that, great. Don't ignore them. But in this case, yes, it will <coughs> treat this as complementing the following, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, F, F. And that's going to put all ones and then zeros. And then it's going to go, is that equal to 0? In, in this case, it's going to convert this one to all zeros as well, 32 bits. And it's going to say, no, they're not equal. And then when it goes and prints it out, it's going to say, oh, well, I only want to print out the lower 8 bits. And so it's going to say, oh, it's 0. <laughs> right? So this is the things you have to worry about when you get to these things. So if you get weird values like this, first go look and see if you have weird error warning messages. And second, go to this chart. <laughs> okay, this chart says, what are we doing with this operand conversion? If you are taking an unsigned 8-bit int and comparing it against an unsigned 8-bit int, you actually use a 32-bit signed int, as it turns out. Oh, what? <laughs> right? It actually is like, kind of, it does that. Now, it does the by the way, it does the signed part because it doesn't care about those upper bits. They're going to be, it's not going to matter if you've got an unsigned 8-bit uh, int, but it's going to tie, it's going to convert them basically into signed ints, and that's the way the conversion is going to happen, right? And it will work fine for this because unsigned ints and unsigned ints, when they are converted, will be the same values and, and will work properly. But you just have to be a little careful with that, right? So what? So if we do some other ones, if we have like an unsigned 32-bit int and we're comparing it against a signed 32-bit int. If we go over and look, what do we get? We get an unsigned 32-bit comparison. So it's good to have a chart like this handy if you start getting weird values in your comparisons. Or, like honestly, the real answer to this is go back over to your program and do something like, oh, okay, either cast it here when you're going to do it, uh, unsigned char or something like that, or set it into a temporary variable. I know it's not quite as fast, but it does save you the trouble of like dealing with these sorts of things. Okay, questions on that? Just got to keep a handy. Yeah, James. Yeah, yeah. If you're comparing, if you're comparing a char, which is an unsigned, eight, an unsigned eight-bit int, you're comparing a char to a 32-bit integer, signed integer, what's it going to do? It's going to treat them both like a signed 32-bit integer, as it turns out. Okay. And that's normally going to work because of the way that, it, yeah. yeah. Go. This might seem really arcane, like, mm -hmm. because I promise you, when you get to the hand buffer and you're dealing uh, with yeah. like, you know, words and pixels and bytes, this is going to bite somebody, right? Whether you're doing this in tilde, and then yeah. boom, like suddenly so keep this in the back of your mind <laughs> right now. 
fear is not this might be your study. Yeah, exactly. All right, let us move on a little bit. Okay, this is, by the way, when you do the wraparound, like we talked about earlier, right? Wraparound happens when you are adding, let's say, an un, or a signed integer, and you get too big for that signed integer, and yet the number of bits will still fit. Because remember, you've got 32 bits here for the signed integer, 30, 32 bits here, and that upper bit is the one that's going to determine whether or not it's negative or positive, based on our two complement rules. Okay, and it's gonna, that's going to do that. But if you're just adding one to the biggest possible int, it ends up wrapping around. And this actually happened in real life at Google, well, YouTube, I guess. Remember Gagnum Style? Remember how that was like really super popular, right? And it got up to like 2 billion hits, uh, watt views, right? And then it got to like a little bit more than 2 billion. And then it all of a sudden started saying negative 2 billion, <clears throat> right? It literally said that for like, six hours or eight hours or so until somebody at YouTube went, uh, we probably shouldn't have used an assigned 32-bit integer to have the, pro the number of watches. And, and nobody really got fired or anything because, look, did anybody think 10 years ago that like things were going to end up with 2 billion hits on YouTube? They probably didn't think about that. So a lot of times it worked. But what did they do? They went and changed to a 64-bit um, integer an unsigned integer, and now it's fine, and it will be fine forevermore because that would be trillions of years of people watching it trillions of times a day before it would ever overflow that number. So they're good now, but you got to watch your code. Even like professional code, actually this happens. So you have to be a little careful with that. Okay. All right. Now, how do you write good system software? Oh boy, that's an entire class. In fact, what's the class that John Osterhout teaches? It's it's like, it's like software engineering or whatever. This is not necessarily systems, but good system software is sometimes a little different than other kinds of software, but the underlying principles are the same. Okay? I changed the picture so they don't know who uh, Pat is. I was like, I feel out a cool picture of Pat frowning here, but I said, let's have a little baby frowning. Take a look at this code. Okay, now let's take a look at this code here. And what's not so great about it? you tell me some things that you don't, you wouldn't like and like if you were in 106B, we'd definitely take off style points for? How about this? Right? Some like constant just thrown into the thing there out of nowhere. It says baud rate, but that doesn't tell. I mean, what? what? That's like bogus, right? I mean, who knows what that value really means, right? How about this stuff? There's your like, okay, I'm going to take the number 7, I'm going to left shift it by 12, I'm going to take the complement, and that's going to be GPO. At least there's a comment to tell you that's GPO 14, right? And now you know because you wrote this basically stuff, like you wrote this stuff for GPIO. But, but it is unclear, and there's lots of like constants in here that seem to come out of nowhere. And if you went to a slightly different version of Raspberry Pi, this will all change. In fact, we had a problem with that a while ago where we had a bunch of comments in, or a bunch of constants in the code that um, when they changed to a new Raspberry Pi, like some of the constant values changed and somebody hadn't done them like that and they had to go and rechange them all. And it's kind of annoying. But what is good code? Something like this, right? Where you actually codify everything in terms, zeros are okay to be constants, but other constants are like, look, what does, now, sure, that's a weird like long thing, but you can go look that up and figure out what it is, but at least it tells you what it is right in the variable name. Okay, this actually is, okay, fine, you're going to use a 270 here, but then it's going to actually do a little, like, how do you get to that value? It's a nice comment there about that, right? And you've got some nice functions that you can have there instead of just doing it. You've got all those functions you guys spent days and days writing, right, that's in there. All right, nice, clean code like this is really what we're striving for. Okay? We're striving to you not use you know, crazy constants out of nowhere, not do random shifts and not comment it and whatever. And I know at the last minute you're like trying to get that print up to work and you throw that like thing in there and it, and it does it. But do the good commenting and do the thing. Okay, admit it. How many people write their code, then go back and write all the comments? Yeah, you're crazy, people. You're crazy. It took me years to learn this. Okay, so when I was your, I did the same thing, right? It took me years to learn that if you write a line of code, if it needs a comment, put it right then because you will not remember exactly what that is later or you'll skip it or whatever. I know it takes an extra 15 seconds to do, but it will save you lots of time later, okay? It will save you lots and lots of time later. And it will slow you down in general but make you write better code as well, right? I mean, I've written like 50 lines of code and then be like, I have no idea what I wrote up there. 
No idea what that was all about. John. So with this code, um, there's only one comment? But yeah. Time. Yeah, there's only one comment. Well, there's two comments, right? There's one up here that says turn on the UART. Okay, big deal. And then this one is the, the comment that actually says The rest of it is spelled out in the code itself, right? So over, co over commenting is just as bad as under commenting. Right? You can overcomment some. I mean, I've, you know, you see 106 A instances all the time. You're like, you know, if blah, 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 and then comment if a blah, blah, blah. And you're like, no, you just told me that with the if statement, right? I don't need to know that. I mean, that's what I can read code, right? But it's like, you know, why are you using some, why are we setting the, you know, the, how are we setting the baud rate? Why is it 270? Where'd that come from? Yeah, stick a comment in there, right? And then, by the way, the header files will probably have details on some of these, although, you know, you don't, even, you don't even need a header file to say, oh, there's the transmit pin on the GPIO. It's right there. It says it right there for you in the name of the function. Okay? Um, some of the code you'll see later uh, has a lot of enums in it. Enums are a great way to do exactly this, where you have a constant and you set, you have a whole bunch of constants you need to define, and you define them all at once, and then just use that value, and it just gets replaced, right? This is actually, what pin is it? One, two, zero, one, two, three, four or something? Whatever the pin is on here, whatever GPIO pin it is, or, 14, yeah. This actually just becomes a 14 because it's defined somewhere else as a constant. It doesn't waste any time, but it makes the code much easier to read. Okay? All right. That's your software engineering <laughs> lesson. <laughs> okay? The idea is well-written software, easy to read and understand. That is your goal. Okay? And we've been telling you this since 106A, but now it becomes even more important because you're writing really arcane stuff dealing with some processor that has this a thousand page manual that tells you exactly what constant you need to use. So we want to write this code nice and easy. Okay? All right, we've gone through all this stuff. Um, don't need those super long comments most of the time, right? And you don't need lots of comments. Um, you should definitely be able to understand the code by reading it at a particular, like you look at the line, you should be able to understand that line. The, the blocks, this is why we have structured code, because we have blocks and structure built into the code. So you have a tiny little function that does one thing and it's easy to debug. Okay. Now, I know some functions like VS and printf or whatever can be like this long, right? But the, the, now, you didn't have to do it that way, right? You could have chunked it up a little bit more, but writing good code is, is great. And, and most of the time, by the way, the compiler will be your friend and inline anything that's necessary. Go right ahead and write that function that's only going to get called once out there. The compiler will go, fine, you only call it once, here it is, boop, right, right in line. Done. So, so you know, do that. Um, there's... The idea of bugs in code and having somebody else fix your code is like you have to keep that in mind because you're going to write a, write a lot of code that somebody else has to eventually read. And unfortunately, you're going to read a lot of code that somebody else wrote. <laughs> and if it's terrible, you're going to like rip your he head out, right? Um, there's a good comic on that. I think if you look up like WTFs per line of code or something like that, look, there's a good comment about like depends on how good the code is written and how many of those you end up saying to yourself, it turns out. Um, okay, and by the way, it's another another uh, way to get good at reading code, become a section leader. If you're a good section leader, you're going to read lots of terrible code and get used to it. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, actually, I can't apply this aside from last point. When I was an undergrad, I was transitioning from like, my getting back to college, I was a section leader, and I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. You read a you read a lot of terrible code, but then you help somebody make it better, or you just give them minus minus and be done with it. But um, <laughs> but you you know you that's why we have IGs and we have things that are you know. So but anyway, the point is yes, that's how you become a good you become a much better at reading code by reading a lot of code, and hopefully you'll end up at companies or whatever where you're reading good code. But please do the world a favor and write good code. Too. Lots of times, um, you know, people go to a company and they go, well, we, we need to rewrite this entire thing because it's terrible, right? Part of it is that code is hard to read, but part of it is that people aren't writing good code to begin with. And it's probably perfectly fine, but getting, you know, to it. You also should use good languages and C does not have the best, like, um, uh, reputation for being the easiest to read language because it can have weird things like, you know, while, we've already seen things like this, right? While, S plus plus equals equals or equals W plus plus or whatever, right? And, uh, semicolon, right? That's terrible. But you should know how to read that because they're it's terse anyway, which is which is an interesting thing. All right. 
Um, another language that is now kind of disappearing a little bit is Perl. Do you still write any Perl at all? Perl, I mean, Perl was, is called a write once language, like write only language. It's a write only language. You're never supposed to read it, right? You write it, it works, and then nobody ever reads it again. It's impossible to read, but other languages are better than, than these. But you have to understand C for this sort of stuff. Um, systems code is terse. Like we want it to be terse, we want it to run fast. We want it to be short, little, tiny functions, and sometimes people pride themselves by writing that little, you know, tweak that makes it a couple lines long, fewer, and so forth. Um, but uh, but it is unforgiving, right? <clears throat> so next week, I think it's next week, we're doing a PS2 lab, which is basically taking a keyboard, not this kind of keyboard, an actual typewriter keyboard, and you're going to plug it into your Pi and like get keystrokes and interpret them. Just kind of fun, right? Um, if any part of the code is wrong, it's not going to work, and the whole code is only 20 to 30 lines long, and there's lots of stuff in those 20 to 30 lines. It's tons of stuff in there. Okay, uh, you're going to do a frame buffer, which uh, Phil mentioned earlier. Ten lines of code. Were you the one who had to debug it for nine hours? No, Dawson. Dawson did. Nine hours for ten lines of code. <clears throat> right? What? Why? Because it's like so. There's like one constant wrong and one this and that. Oh, Mm, yeah, not even probably not. It's not a, that in this case it probably wasn't about the number of lines of code. It was about what are you trying to like? What's happening here? And what's maybe it is? Yeah, I mean you, you you probably could have expanded that out a little. Now, by the way, the frame buffer has to be really fast. So that's the the big key to that. Is you can't have a lot of extra stuff in there. Phil. Yeah, you heard about this, this nine hours for ten lines of code. Yeah. Dawson gave me a call on the phone and we solved it in ten minutes. Right? Just because the key got really yeah, yeah. Really and he's banging and he's banging and he just can't figure it out, right? Yeah. Um, and I, you know, yeah. I was yeah, that was that. By the and this happened to me the other day too. I, I sat here and played around with this stuff we're going to look at later for a few hours, and then finally called Phil and he came and solved it for a minute. So, um, wasn't quite a minute, but two minutes. Yeah, two minutes. So, anyway, okay. So this is the kind of good code we're looking for. We've already seen that. All right. Let's go into some other details. I do want to get to the fun stuff, uh, so we got to kind of press on here. Let's talk about um, pointers and structures and so forth, and basically structures in this case. Remember how memory, this is going to be back, back, going back just a little bit in some sense. Remember how memory is just one big long array, okay? And it's actually, remember, it's byte addressable, so you can only address every eight bytes, and, but it's really just one big long array that we have to deal with. Okay, we have already talked about endianness a little bit. I just want to remind you that when you are down, when you are looking at your code for this week, you may see you may see something that looks like this when it has a printout of the code. Okay, and it's gonna and you're gonna look at the characters in there, and the characters are gonna be in hex, but it's gonna look like M A I N and then a backslash zero like that, and you're gonna go, what is that? I should have written it the other way around. Right? It's because in memory, the way they printed it out in GDB for you, it's going to be backwards from the way it looks in, uh, in the memory system because it's actually reading it backwards because it's like doing ints, which are little endian, so it actually flips them in GDB so they read like regular integers. I just wanted to remind you of that, that there's, you have to remember that our machines are little endian, which means the integers in memory, the bytes are going to be backwards from what you think they are. Just keep that in mind. Okay, as we as we go along. All right, we have also already talked about this. Arrays are only pointers sometimes, right? And this is actually the best slide I've actually seen on this. I didn't write this one. It says a pointer is a location in memory storing an address, right? So you've got this location in memory, and that location in memory holds an address. An array is a location in memory that stores the data. So it's a little bit different, and, and the compiler keeps track of like that variable for the array, and there is no memory location that stores the address of that array until you put it into a pointer or until you do something else. Okay, so keep that in mind. This probably came in really handy when you did printf2 because you had to deal with arrays and so forth. Once you're getting into malloc and so forth, you have to think about, hey, where do pointers, where can I use pointers, and where do I have arrays, and how do the differences you know, manifest themselves? Okay. Let's talk about um, some code here. Actually, just some C structs. Okay, structs. Structs are a way of packaging up your data so that you've got one 
it's not really an object in the object-oriented way of things, but in C it's basically an object, and it's a whole bunch of things that are packaged together under the name data. In fact, there's a, they forgot here, a semicolon. It needs to have a semicolon. Sometimes you type def this into another type, but if you don't, if you leave it like this, every time you refer to data, you need to say struct data. This is a C thing. Okay, you don't have to do that in C++, it turns out. Um, but in C, you have to say struct data, and it refers to the data structure. Okay, and that's the way it goes. Yeah. So if you're trying to make a data, I want. You know, my yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to make a data, good call. You say something like this. You say struct data d semicolon, and that will make you a data. And then you can say d dot fields, etc. Right. That's how that works. Most of the time, we won't do it quite like this. We are going to declare it as a pointer, and then with pointers, instead we do d arrow fields when we have a pointer. Right? You'll see, you'll see an example of this in a few minutes. All right, so <clears throat> what do C structs look like in memory? They're actually just laid out in memory, one, one per, uh, field after another as you go along here, okay? And, and this is how you are going to define this like this, okay? So in memory, you've got the fields. Now, C, in fact, I'll talk about that here. C guarantees that when you do a structure with a bunch of fields, they will be in memory in the order you declare them as. C determines, C says, fine, you want to put them in that order, I will put them in that order. But it gets a little bit more subtle when we talk about alignment issues, which we are going to see in a second. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to show you this in, uh, in one second. All right, so here's, here's basically how this rec struct would end up being laid out in memory. Okay, ints are how long? Four bytes. Four bytes, four bytes. Ints are four bytes, so an int array of two would be how many bytes? Eight bytes. And then ints, pointer, or all pointers are also on your pi, how long? They're actually four bytes as well. So take a look. I takes up the first four bytes. J takes up the next four bytes. A zeroes the first four bytes of, that, of the next four bytes. A1 is the next four bytes. Right? It's however many there are in A. And then the pointer takes up the last four bytes there. And so your struct, if you said size of, which is an operator you can use in C, if you said size of rec, you would end up getting how much? 20 bytes. 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4 is 20 bytes. Okay, That's how that lays it out in memory. Details on that. Well, um, you, it's guaranteed to be in the order you defined. Okay? The array is now embedded in the structure. This is a little weird. Arrays are not somewhere else in memory on the stack or whatever. They are actually embedded into the struct, which is interesting. And then um, pointers are just like also embedded in there. I mean, they're not the, like that's just the, the value there. And um, you've got some offsets in there that will get added um, by the compiler to actually figure that out. I wanted to look at a little bit of code on our Raspberry Pi, or at least on the, in the debugger here, and I want to show you what this actually looks like. So here's the code we're going to look at. It's going to set up an, a struct, we're going to say struct rec r, and then we're going to set r dot i to 1, j to 2, a0 to 3, a1 to 4, and then the pointer to 8000. Let's see what that actually looks like. Okay, so now I'm going to bring this back up because I don't think we, whoops, not like that, I'm not going to. There we go. Okay, so we're going to bring this back up to here, and let's see, I think I've got it. Is it here? Yes. Okay, so this is the code you've got in front of you, actually. If you look at, the, if you don't have it, there's some of the copies in the back. Okay, and the first part we're going to look at is just this top part, and then just the part where it's setting R. In fact, we'll look at it all together as we go. But what I do is I already, I think I already compiled it. Yep, I already compiled it. I'm going to run arm gdb on it. So we're going to do the gdb and struct.elf and I'm going to do target sim and load and we are going to break on main and then I'm going to run it. Okay, so can you guys see down at the bottom here? I'll make it up just a little bit here. Um, so basically, we're going to set all these values. Next, 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 next. And let's go look at the memory for that. So if I just print out R, what's nice is it will actually tell me that G GDB is nice enough to do all this like, oh, I can print this out for you. That's very nice. But let's look at it in memory. If we want to do that, we use the X command. X slash 20X will print out 20 ints. Verse, okay, we're going to have 20 ints to turn. We don't need that many, but it's going to do 20 ints. And then if I do ampersand r, 
it will print out the 20. Oh, I wish, hang on, I should make it a little, there, nope, not quite. I'm gonna make it a little smaller so we can read it all, oh, there we go, okay. All right, does it make sense that i is an int, four bytes, right? So is j, a zero is four bytes, a one is four bytes, and the pointer is four bytes. You see how it laid it out in the right order and that's how it works? We can also do this in GDB, we can print size of a, sorry, size of r, and it will tell you 20. <clears throat> okay, now if you look at the code, while well, I've got it up here, let's just look at this. We can also, well, I tell you, we'll, we'll hold on, we'll hold on the other, yeah, well, let's actually look at this one. This one, if you look at the actual original code, let's look at what with jar struct looks like. It's got an ij and then two characters in there. Characters are how many bytes? One. And so you would think that it would go ij44111 four, four, one, one, and then four more for this. Pack it nicely in there. Watch what happens when we do this. If we do next, 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 and then we look at, we do the same thing, x slash 20x for ampersand wc. Take a look at this. Okay. Here is wc, the first one, that's i, that's j. Look what they did with a and b, great. They put a here and b here. Remember this is backwards in memory because the memory locations actually are going up this way because it's printing them in little endian format. And then it leaves four, two extra bytes free there, but then the k actually ends up way over there. Why didn't it pack it together? Alignment. <laughs> Okay, that's why it didn't pack it together. It didn't pack it together because of alignment. And what that means is that it's going to basically say, I have to put every new four byte thing on a boundary that's four bytes. So it's, you're not gonna necessarily get the total packaging, packing of these structs. You have to be a little careful with that, <clears throat> okay? So you have to be a little careful and you'll see as you go along through there how it goes, all right? Now, this is going to be important for your malloc assignment. Laying a struct onto memory. If you come up with a struct, you can actually cast some memory location to that a pointer of that struct and then in add those values at that pointer location. Take a look at what I'm doing here. What I've got here is I've said, okay, um, I've got, I'm creating some array it's 1,024. I'm filling it with this weird value, dead beef. Anybody heard about that one before? Yeah, dead beef is, it's used throughout the software industry, actually, to populate blank memory so that if you're scanning through memory, you can find where your values live because you just read a whole bunch of dead beef, dead beef, dead beef until you get there. D-E-A-D-B-E-E-F are all character or digits in hex, so it works just fine. It was kind of fun, and I put that in there. All right. So then what you can do is you can find some random location. Turns out you probably should make it on a boundary of four. If you do not, your um, the arm will probably just fail. <laughs> so it will, it will silently fail. The compiler will not care about it, but the, the arm architecture will. So make sure you do, it's not quite random. It's a random value that's on a four-byte location. And then you can just cast that location to your struct. Uh oh you can cast that location to the struct and you will end up getting to, getting it to work just fine. Let's see how that works in our memory. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that here. In fact, what I'm going to do is break on line 36. So I've populated our memory. Continue. There we go. Now I'm going to do this. And if we look at the memory for our array, x slash, let's do 50x um, of the array, right? There's all our dead beefs. Right? And it's nice. I got all these dead beefs in there, and it's great, and we can see that that's doing it. Okay, now if we walk through the code, and remember, we're going we're gonna to keep, what we're going to do is start populating that. I'm going to cast random, I'm going to cast that random location to our struct, and I'm just going to say, access the ith one and put a five there, and then put a six, and then a seven, and then an eight, and then the eight thousand. And if we go back and look at our array again, oh, look at this. Isn't it easy to find our data? We go, oh, dead beef, up. Oh, there's our data. Right? And our data is right there because we can go and look and find it. And that's, the, that's how it ends up populated. And it, we just populated it at 64, 65, 66, or sorry, 64, 68, 60, etc. And that's how it actually does it in memory. It makes sense? You can populate these just like that. Yeah. Um, wait, so why is it? 
Yeah, let's look at the code again. Uh, lists, let's say 30. If you look at the code here, okay, what are we doing? We're actually um, casting, or we're setting the random location 64 bytes into the array. And that, that's what we're doing there. We're saying the address 64 bytes into the array. Uh, yeah, good question. Yep. Why don't yep. the cars 7 and 8 get put in the same block? They're not cars. Oh, uh, they are because they are not cars. Oh, Aren't they ints? They're, it's an int array? Right. It's an int array. So it's an in, when, you, when you say 7 and 8, that's the 32-bit integer, 7 and 32-bit integer. Eight. Okay. All right, that's how structs work and lay out, laying out in memory. Okay, this is what it looks like when you actually do the GDB. Okay, now, where can we actually use this? Well, this is where your, your, um, pro, your heap allocator comes into play, okay? Let's say that you create a header like this. This is actually from the, straight from the uh, assignment web page, okay, the, the secondary web page that you can click to. And if you have this header here, and you can do exactly that, you can take a header place it on your memory at some pointer value you get back, maybe offset by a little bit to be on a header, and then you can use it just like that and it will populate the values very nicely. Okay, So I'm going to really quickly go through the, how the implicit heap allocator works, Okay, and we, I'm going to spend no more than 10 minutes on this. Okay, So that you got 10 minutes, then these slides will be available to you as well. Okay, but we're going to see how this actually works as we do it on a heap. Let's say that we start out with a heap that has 96 bytes in it. Okay, and I'm going to just do it like this. We're going to say that that zero is actually location 9,000, and then 9,004, 9,008, just because it's not really zero. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to have 96 bytes here. Okay, and none of this data is initialized. That's what all the question marks are for. And then we're going to set the heap up. Okay. You have to be a little careful this when you do your assignment. Make sure you put in a function that sets your heat up, heap up because you, it's not built in there for you. Okay? You set the heap up, and how do you do that? Well, with this implicit list, this is what Phil talked about the other day. With this implicit list, what you do is you say, okay, I am going to take part of my heap, and I'm going to say, how many bytes free do I have? And I'm going to say, okay, I've got 88 bytes free, and I'm going to populate the next byte to be zero, meaning it's free. One would be used. Okay, so in other words, this is how your heap starts out with nothing in it. Okay, John, I'm looking at you like, what are you talking about? Go ahead. What's your question? Just like, we're going to use a whole four bytes for zero. I know you shouldn't. You 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 can. This is the way. That's a that's a good. I'm glad that's the question you asked. Yes, when we did it this way, we did it, used a whole four bytes for zero. You can make it much more efficient if you want to. So this is just like showing you how it's done in, in big terms here. All right, but the point is that we're going to set this up. We're going to have this header here, which is part of our heap. We only get 88 bytes because we have to use a whole eight bytes to store it out of our 96 <coughs> bytes. Okay. All right, and how would you do that in your thing by laying this out onto the thing? Let's say your heap start is defined for you at 9,000. You would do struct header star to cast this, and you say arrow payload size equals 88, arrow status equals zero. Done. Yeah. Um, what does the status? Mean? Okay. If you're if you are doing malloc and you call malloc and you say malloc and you give it some some number of bytes and this let's say we do 24 bytes, right? You need to set those. You need to make sure that the pointer you pass back is never used by any other program or any other part of the program. So you set that block to be used at that point. In other words, you're telling your heap allocator don't reallocate this space. Somebody else is already using it. That's what it's doing. So you're just a, it's a boolean. It's a here's the memory. You'll see how this works in a second. Well, wait till I get to the actual example on the next slide, and you will see how this actually works. Here's how a whole bunch of mal. We're going to do malloc 16, malloc 8, malloc 16, malloc 8, malloc 8. Then we're going to free d, which is the value we the d pointer. And then we're going to free c, and we're going to realloc a. And you'll see how this actually works. Okay, let's walk through this. Okay, if we are going to do malloc of 16, where is that 16? Where are those 16 bytes going to come from? Actually, you know what? It's hard to see the grip. Can you guys see that that's gray over there? Oh, you can. Okay, in this angle, it's hard to see. Where are those 16 bytes going to come from? It's going to come from this 16 bytes right here. Four, 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 four. Those 16 bytes are the ones we're going to use. Why? Because we have a free block of 88 bytes 
this whole section to use from. We're going to chunk out that those 16 bytes to be used for A. How do we do that mechanically? We actually say, okay, fine. We say, great, we're going to use 16 bytes. We change the header to say 16 bytes are used. Andre, now, now you see why it's used. So I'm about to pass that pointer back to the program, and this is no longer for me accessible for me to get space from. So it's just like saying, like, these 16 bytes are used and one is true. Like, Correct. One is true being used. Zero would be like, oh, these aren't used. Correct. Now, look what we did here. We then said, oh, with the rest of this space in that block, we're going to car say how much is left, and you have to do a little bit of arithmetic here. You have to say, okay, well, it was 88 was there, and then minus the 16, minus another 8 for this header, that leaves us with 64 bytes, and this whole rest of this is free. Everybody with me there? Okay. All right, how about malloc of B? What do you have to do to malloc B? How do we do that? By the way, we only have a pointer right here. <laughs> right? <clears throat> what we have to do is we have to say, oh, do we have space here for our memory? Well, first of all, no, because it's used. Then we go and we find this location. How, given this information, do we find this block? Just add 16 to it, right? You're going to bought a pointer math involved with these heap allocators. Okay? So you're going to add 16 to it, and you're going to get here, and you're going to go, oh, now 64, I do have enough bytes for my 8-byte allocation. And... That's the way it goes. By the way, if I had said seven bytes, I would also need eight bytes. You have to align this on a four-byte boundary. You'll see that from the assignment. I didn't actually use that as an example. I probably should have. Okay. But anyway, what do we pass back to B? We pass back the value 90020 because that's where B starts writing its stuff. Here to here, those are the eight bytes it has available to it. Okay. All right. C and D are going to be basically the same thing. C, we have to jump twice to get there. Find the free block and do that. And the same thing is going to be hap happen with E and D and E. Okay, by the end of all those malics, this is what the heap looks like. In fact, we've used it all. Right? You've got A's going to be here, and B's here, and C's here, and D's here, and E's there. And that's your whole heap right now. And you actually can't malloc anything else. But we can free some things. If we say free D, well, how do I find where D lives here? No, you don't start from the header. You go right to the location there. D's location is 9048, and that's here. And you go how many back? Eight back, right, to get to here. And you go, there's where the header starts. Pointer arithmetic. It is so easy to free, it's going to be a little crazy. Well, at least the initial thing, you just basically free it. <laughs> you say, I'm marking it as zero, and that's that. It is a little bit more subtle. If there are two free blocks in the row, we want you to actually, what we call, coalesce them which means combine them together. You'll see how that works in a second. If we now free C, to free C, we're going to go and we're going to mark this to be 0. And then now are we not, don't we have this block free and this block free? Doesn't that seem like a waste if you've got two free blocks next to each other with a weird like header in the middle there? What we're going to do is we're going to coalesce this. We're going to jump ahead and see, hey, is the next block free? If it is, take the whole block and make it update the size. Okay. And by the way, if you haven't really read through the assignment yet, this all might not make sense. Go back to the slides and, the, and, and look at it again. Okay, so what do we do? We say, oh, great. We free C, and then we look ahead and we go, oh, that one's free too. Let's take all of that, and now we have a 32-byte section free, and we actually got eight bytes back because we don't have a header in there too. Woo-hoo. Okay, so that's nice. And then we have to do realloc. Now, realloc has two things that can happen. If... You go here in the A and you say, oh, do I have enough space to put 20? You update that number to 20 and you're done. <laughs> or actually, you don't even update. You just add, give it the total amount that's necessary. If not, and in this case it's not, what, what does realloc do? It says, hey, take my data, move it somewhere else, and now use that as a, the new location and pass back that pointer. Is there anywhere here where I can put 20 bytes now? Anybody else free this 20 bytes? This one's not, this one's not, this one is, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to move all of the data from, we find the free block, then we move the data, and then we make this block free now, and we pass back this location. That's how realloc works. That's the end of it. Yeah? So realloc A means that you're taking the 16 bytes 
moving them somewhere else if you need to and doing that. Well, what do you, why do you use realloc? You're trying to populate some buffer, bing, 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 you're putting some, and then you run out of space. And you go, oh no, I need more space. If I need more space, I'm going to say, hey, memory system, can you give me more memory on the end of this one? <laughs> Many times it will be able to, and it will give you back the same pointer, and you'll be like, great, here I go. And I can just keep writing there. Sometimes it can't, like here, where it has to go, oh, okay, I can't do that. But I will find a new location that can fit all your 20 bytes. I will move your first 16 there, and then pass you back the correct pointer. So it does the moving for you as well. But isn't that a chunk of 32? No? It is a chunk of 32. And the question is, why is it a chunk of 32? That's my next point. But before we get to that, Kai... Yeah. Like, what if we had like 24 bytes yep. in the beginning and then we would have yep. like the... Don't ever put a location that has less than 8 bytes free because you might have to put a header there. So never allocate space where you have a header next to a header. doesn't make any sense to do. So if we ask for... So say where the 16 zero is, if we ask for 24 there, it would just make it 32? In fact, it does make it 32 because you can't even fit... You could If you look back here... You go, okay, if I tried to make it just 20, four, one, two, three, four, five, that would leave this, the block would now be here, and you'd only have four bytes here, and that would not make any sense to do. Yeah. You only want to leave it where there's an eight byte eight bytes left. So we just give it all 32 and go, okay, it's a little bit of waste there, but we recoup it later when we in the big picture we recoup it. Yeah. Now, Elise, your question was. Why is it 32? That's why it's 32. Because if you don't, if if you are going to have too little amount of space over here, don't even bother. Not even worth doing. So we just give it all 32, and we say that's it. End of story. And that's and then a. By the way, a doesn't know that it has 32 to use, but it really does if it if it you know happened to use it. Yeah. A min, yeah, the block size is going to be a minimum, so as it, it turns out. Yeah. Well, yeah, it can be 12, I suppose. It can be enough to hold 12. But yeah, yeah. Um, Two more questions, then we're moving on. Sorry, you can ask these questions in office hours. Yes? So if A takes up 32 bit bytes, bytes yeah. now, what happens when, if we free E, does it? No. Unfortunately, if you free E, there's nothing you can do about it. Because you can't look backwards in this sort of, you can't look backwards in this sort of heat. Right. You can actually, if you if you free in the wrong order, you can end up freeing like this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, and you will never coalesce them. Too bad. You can't look backwards in this. If you wanted to, you could put footers as well, and then you can do it. But it's a little bit more advanced. Okay. Last question, Kristen. Oh, I was just kind of confused when you got rid of like the A in the 16 area and then like moved it. So yep. You have 32 area because isn't like 16 plus 20 36? Oh no, you were you were saying in this in the thing here you're saying give me space for only twenty bytes. And it's going, okay, good. I'm gonna move your previous sixteen that you had and I'm gonna give you an extra four and that's gonna be in here. Oh, I see. No more questions. Ask it later. Ask it. I just want to get to the other fun stuff. I promised you fun stuff. Okay, why do I have this big giant keyboard here that weighs eighty five pounds and I broke my back bringing it down? Here's why. We have been giving you lots of stuff to do that's so low level and seems so like, oh, wow, it prints some stuff to the screen, right? And you're like, oh, boy, big deal, right? <laughs> we wanted to show you some of the things that you're going to be – remember you get to do a cool final project in here for the last few weeks of class? Lots of people do things with music. How do we actually do that? I'm going to skip some of these, some of these slides here, but the point is that music is analog. When you hear a note, it's got it's like not bits and things, right? And you can actually build music, like devices that actually use this analog idea. You're kind of tuning a digital conversion into analog, and it gets hairy. I don't know if you noticed on your Pi, there is a, a output for a, a headphone jack. And so you can actually use that. And if you do, you've got to like manipulate this. Where there's going to be a whole lecture later in the quarter, I think Phil's doing it, on sound. You're going to do that lecture where you're talking about this stuff? Okay. So this is why we're going to skip it right now. You could do it this way, where you have filters and capacitors and all this kind of stuff and the big audio circuits and all this. I'm skipping this because it doesn't matter for right now, right? It's got all this like sine waves and all this stuff, right? There's another way to do it. If we want real music, and real is uh, defined a little... Go ahead, Phil. You're like, Oh, yeah, 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 sure. The keyboard is doing all this for us. It's going to. 
Okay? If we want real music, we can do this thing called MIDI. And what it is, is you have that hardware, let's say built into a $5,000 keyboard, or I don't know how much you paid for this, but an expensive little beatbox thing too. By the way, if I, if I open this up, if I turn this on, this is an actual MIDI device that, it's a little like drum thing, right, that, that, uh, that uh, Phil owns here. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually output to this device. Okay, we're going to output to this device. The nice thing is there is a standard for this. Of course there is. There's a standard in the 1970s that somebody said, wait a minute, we're gonna, why don't we have these cool, like we've got these cool computers, why don't we make our computers play our digital instruments for us and we can, the whole world will open up in terms of what we can now do with sound and music. And um, 1982 was when this standard was first described, and it actually has weathered relatively well for that long of time. Okay, And what we can do is we can look up how to do this MIDI stuff, and it turns out it's just a serial connection just like the UART that we've already seen that's using your bootloader and that, that you're printing out with and so forth, and it's got some interesting details about it, right? If you want to turn a note on, okay, you use the following code, 1001, and then the details of the actual channel that you need to go on to, okay? There's 10 different channels, well, I think there's more, probably lots of different channels, probably 32 or something like that, some power up to. You can have some number of, you can have, the number of channel, or the channel you're in, and then you have some parameter about like what note it's going to be and what um, and and what type of instrument it is and so forth. And those that's going to happen. And then you turn the note on, and then at some point later you turn the note off. It's basically the computer controlling the keyboard and saying, okay, I'm going to I'm going to turn the note on off. Now with keyboards and things, is this on now? Yeah. With keyboards and things, you press the note and it kind of fades out or whatever. It if you had set it to be like an organ or something, you could actually have this set and stay on for as long as you want and then cut off. And, and it's all, you know, there's a thousand different instruments and so forth. And you can also do pitch bending and so forth where you're changing the, if you, if you play a note, right, you can have things like that. And, and it all, all can be programmed through the, through the processor, which is pretty cool, okay? Well, what is this actual output like? Well, it's just UART, like we said. It is, in fact, very similar to what we've seen for ASCII, right? It's 8N1, which means we have 8 bytes. We've got a start, but, or start, sorry, 8 bits. We've got a start bit, and we've actually got a potential for a parity bit in there, which is another bit that says, and you remember the CRC check that we did? It's the same similar sort of thing where it's saying, did I get the right bits? And then there's a stop bit, one or two stop bits. That's the whole format, which means that we can actually make our Pi do that. Well, how do you do that? Okay, so you've got this cable here, and if you if you look, there's a there's a DIN cable that looks like this, and the way that the instructions or the way the standard goes, it says you need this, you need to connect this up with a resistor and some this thing called an optocoupler, and what that does is it says I'm going to keep the electronics from the keyboard or from the device separate from the electronics from the computer, right? And it does that using light. Optocouplers are the coolest little things. It's actually a little LED and a little LED receiver, and it sends signals through light inside this little chip, and it's very cool. Um, but we didn't have those, or we didn't want to bother using those, or Phil didn't want to bother using those when he came up with this idea. So he said, fine, let's just like take that out and just like try it, and we'll see if it works. And if we blow up our keyboard, we blow up our keyboard, and it turns out we didn't. And so it actually works just fine, and there's a little more like electronics wizardry going on here. But basically it means take two resistors, plug it in, and you're going to go. And then, once you do that, right, you actually plug it into a machine and you actually do some coding, right? And that's what you have on, on, your, uh, on your sheet, too. You've got the MIDI code. Notice it is a page and, like, six lines of code, right? Now, this is not the entire standard, but it's part of the standard. And it's actually pretty darn simple, okay? It's basically saying hey, I'm going to send some bytes when I get them, I'm going to turn on a channel, I'm going to set the channel, and I'm going to output those bytes in the form that it did this. Phil, so tell me it took you more than like an hour to write this code. Or, or did you look it up? No? Uh, this I don't know if you looked, but anyway, my, my point is that there was a lot of like... Less than an hour to write, more than an hour to write. <laughs> there you go, more than an hour to write. Right. Yeah. The point is that Still had to go look up the code, look up how to do this, and then just make the pie do it. And it's all the same things we've been already learning. You guys know how to do this if you looked it up. A couple interesting things about it. 
Um, in terms of the timing, oh boy, timing, don't get me started because this is what screwed me up the other day when, we were, when, when I was looking at it. Um, if you look at the notice on here, it says baud rate. It actually says 332,000. That's not the real baud rate of this, this thing. The, the, it's a little bit fudged because the timing isn't exact in some of these things. And it actually should be uh, 31,250, I believe, is what it is, which is a weird baud rate to begin with. I don't know why they chose that in 1982, but they did. You have to deal with that. There's other issues of notice back here, by the way. Normally, we connect a pin and ground. In this case, it's connecting a pin in high voltage, which seems a little odd. It means that when you're doing the code, like Phil had to figure this out, where you had to do the inversion of all the bits, right? And you had to like get out a logic analyzer and do this, OK? Well, let's look at some of those, that code. You've got, you've got some of the code here. If we look at the code called MIDI, oh, wrong window here. There it is. Uh, MIDI beats. Oh, why am I not doing it? There we go. Uh oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. Beat. All right, uh, there we go. Dot C. Okay, if we look at this code, Phil is just such a nice guy. He writes really nice code, right? And he looked at his little machine here, and it says on here, oh, I've got a, a high tom and a low tom and a CL hat and so forth. And and when you type those, that, that's what comes out. And he actually did this in an enum, so it's nice and like defined. And he had to go look up the values for this in some, in something. And then he has like, <clears throat> here's how we do the actual, uh, the beats for the actual uh, thing. And then he says, oh look, I got to initialize my GPI on the timer and so forth. And then init and whatever. And then he's just going to walk through all of the little beats down here. Okay, all the little types that you can do and output them to the actual like little box that does this, okay? And if I connected everything else up all right, my light is blinking on the pie to say I'm ready for the details, and I've already made it, I believe. If I do RPI install and then midi.beats.bin, see if that should work. It will find the serial port, send it. Now, what's happening right now? I know, this is like, thanks for Phil. What's happening right now is this program that was like 15 lines of code plus some constants, right, is now making this box do that just through the pie. Like literally the pie is telling, sending these bytes one after a time and making that do that. That is pretty cool. And you guys can do stuff like this for your project at least. How is that connected to the pie? Through two wires. But how, the, like, the, the other end of this is got, I, no, well, the pins? It's, yeah, it's, it literally the looks, like, it looks like this, two wires that are going into your pie. That's it. I, I literally, I took this cable. So, well, I had to do a little soldering and I had a resistor and whatever. But I mean, it was just basically I cut the wire and then I made the pins, like I soldered a thing on there to make the pins work and that's that. Comments on this one, Phil, before I show them the other one? Okay, so that was this one. And if I actually just take this one out and plug it straight into the, I think this will should work too. There we go. That's what's happening on the keyboard, okay? The keyboard is interpreting it differently than the other one. In fact. Stuff. It's really annoying. <laughs> the keyboard is interpreting those same output as keys for the uh, for the actual piano, which is a little, which is the same like thing. But you could probably set the. I could have set the instrument a little different. It might have done that. Phil. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Now, Phil made another one, midi.lamb.c, which has a whole bunch of, like, it's got, now he said, well, I've got a keyboard now, so I can do it with actual notes. And if you guys are musicians, G's and A's and B's and C's are just notes. Okay. And then he said, okay, a half note is this long, and a quarter note is that long, and a pause is that long. And he just wrote, he wrote a little notes like this. And he said, oh, there's all my notes. And then 10 lines, of, not even, seven lines of code will actually run through the array and output those to the pie. And so if we do this and bin, let's see if this works. And then it just repeats, right? Isn't that neat? 
how that works. This is the kind of stuff that you can do by knowing a little bit of electronics and a little bit of that. And we're not going to listen to this more. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and the same thing, it, it decayed like that. Um, and so, um, so that's how we can do that. Now, what else can you do with this? Okay, so you can print out music like that, but what if you want to, like now your Pi is doing something. Well, what I did was I just wrote a little, another one that is um, with a button. And I have one button that I put on my Pi. And <clears throat> if this works, then you will see, as I go over to my, my breadboard here, and I just push the button, right? That's all it does, so, which is not cool as cool as like little lamp. <laughs> But what if you had 10 buttons? And what if you had a little like sensor that when you waved your hand over it, it played some button or, or played some key or you had multiple sensors or whatever? The world is your oyster, right? And because you can do this sort of stuff with a little bit of code, knowing a little bit of reading on how to do the, like get the actual notes out there, a couple hours of 20 minutes of writing code, an hour of debugging code, you know, whatever, or maybe two, and then you can actually do this stuff. And your final projects will be something akin to this level of stuff, right? So that should be the exciting part. Yes? What were those numbers in the code? Are like A365 or whatever? Yeah, A365 means that it was, okay, so if you go over to the keyboard and you go and you type an A, right? That might be A65 or 63 or whatever, and then the next A up, might be a, a different one. And it's all built into the standard of like, if you want to play this note at this frequency, it's going to be A3, or sorry, it's going to be A, whatever it is up here. A3 is, is note 59. But what are the numbers? The, somebody defined oh, the like standard. The 59th key on the yeah, it's like the 59th key on the key, like right? Just defined, already. just defined somewhere for you. Yep. Yeah. So. So can I, can you can, okay, so that's a very good question. Can you play two notes at once? Nope. But. This is going at 31,000 bits per second, right? Divide by about 10 for about the number of n bytes you can do. About, about uh, what is that? Uh, 300 and something bytes per notes per second. You can play a note faster than your ear can actually hear the difference of playing it one after the other. So to you, it will sound like it's exactly the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you are sending a turn on, you are sending a duration for how long it's, the key is struck for. It's like an odd thing, but yeah, you turn it on and then you turn it off later. So if you want to do two at the same time. Oh yeah, 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 sorry, you could do that too, yes. You could, you could turn it on, turn the next one on, and they would both be on at the same time. Yes. Yeah, that's the way the standard works. Who else? Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Last three weeks of class, I believe it is? Yeah. Two, oh, two, is it two? Oh, right, right. Anyway, okay. Any other questions on that? Yeah, sir. Do you have a different, like, input-output plug? Could you plug the keyboard into Pi and, like, play keys and then translate it into code? Absolutely. Cool. Totally do that. In fact, there's there's four different MIDI things. There's two outs here. If I plugged it into the out and I just plugged it, instead of doing the transmit, I turned it into the receive, ta-da, you're now receiving MIDI. And I could play all these keys, and you could record it, and you could play it back, and you could do whatever you want. Yeah. yeah so I think there was actually a contest last year where the Raspberry Pi would display the music as you should play it, and then if you hit keys, it would show you what you're actually playing. Yeah. We do have a keyboard that's part of the, this is Jerry Kane's keyboard that I swiped from his office, but um, there's another keyboard that you can use if you want to do something like that, and it does output. It doesn't do input, unfortunately, but it does output. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. So Sam. Yeah, the, it, because there's no clock, as it turns out, and there, at least we haven't built the clock in, it doesn't, it, it's basically saying, wait, what bytes am I getting? I don't understand any of this. I don't, and then it takes a little bit to catch up, and then it finally goes, I got it. And then it started playing. And it took a few notes. Yeah, part of it. All right, anybody else? I hope that, like, whet your appetite for some cool stuff that you're going to do for your final projects, even though you're now you're writing heap allocators. <laughs> All right, see you guys later.